Vi byder jer alle sammen velkommen øh, til øh, denne fantastiske smagning, vi skal have nu øh, med Chablis og, og Bourgogne, og heldigvis er det ikke øh, australsk Shiraz i den her hede, vi skal drikke, men det er kølig Chablis og, og kølig øh, hvide fra det øvrige Bourgogne. Og, øh, vi har Samantha med øh, fra Bouchard, øh, som øh, vil, vil, vil stå for, for det her rit. I er meget velkommen ja. til at skrive eventuelle spørgsmål i, øh, i chatten, så skal vi tage den. Men uh, yes, let's uh, let's get to it because we have a, a tight schedule. It's uh, it's six six wines we uh, we're gonna try for the next hour. Uh, and I know you have a lot to to say about uh, the domains and uh, about William Fever in general and, and Bouchard and, and and Burgundy in in general. So um, yeah. Samantha. Sorry. Thank you so much for uh, taking your time, and uh, I'll, I guess we will start from uh, from the north in uh, Chablis and move down south. Is that correct? X wine while I talk, and we will be switching the wines during the whole conversation, so we yes. can taste a lot and uh, not be waiting for for the end of the day. <laughs> So I propose you to start with the Petit Chablis. Uh, we are beginning, yes, exactly. So we will start our trip in uh, from the north, from the north of Burgundy, three hours from Chablis, three, from Paris, I'm sorry. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much. I think we're living pretty much the same summer. It's uh, completely warm here. And uh, well, a little bit too much, but that's the way it is. We this year we had we struggled actually to get some sun during the the spring, but maybe you you guys did the same. So uh, well, and I speak. So, sorry, from Samantha, uh, are you in Bonn right now? I'm in Bonn. In Bonn, exactly. You're in Bonn. Yeah. Yes. I'm in Bonn right now, and actually, this is a nice picture of Bonn with all the village in a in a. This is during the during the autumn where the leaves are about to fall. And of course, it's always very, very humid. So, uh, but today it's a Chardonnay day. It's all about Chardonnay. We will start, uh, if you want to sip a little bit of Petit Chablis, we will start up in the north. And this is the, the, the most friendly and basic uh, appellation in this uh, northern uh, Bourgogne area. So, well, the Chardonnay is a very, of course, a very well-known well uh, well uh, var varietal. It's very easy because they, she knows how to struggle against the frost a little bit, but she knows how to struggle against the heat. So uh, as you can see, it's planted almost everywhere in the world. But well, today we're doing an homage and, um, and, and a focus in Burgundy because this is actually where it comes from. For your information, the Chardonnay comes from a village that is called Chardonnay that is in the south of Burgundy in the Maconnet area. So, um, well, um, just to, to tell you where we are. So from Paris, we start with Chablis. So we will do three references from William Ferrand, and we will do uh, other three references from La Côte d'Or, Bouchard Père et Fils, just to give you a, a big idea. So we are a group, the Champagne Rio, it's the, the owner, it's the head of the group, and they own William Ferrand and they own um, Bouchard Père et Fils. So our first trip will start with the North, up in here, but just to get you to know that Burgundy is very rare. We are only the 0.3 production of the whole world, and we occupy only the 7% of the appellations in France. So um, very well segmented. Here for the Petit Chablis, she wrote with the first uh, with the first wine. The Petit Chablis, as we can see, it's actually marked in yellow in this different area. The Petit Chablis that you have, the objective is to have a Chardonnay fresh, a Chardonnay to end your day of work, uh, full of citrus, um, a little bit of uh, flowering and uh, good acidity to wake up your papillons before, uh, before you start uh, a meal, but it's perfect as an aperitif. Uh, this Petit Chablis is considered in a category, uh, I'll try to show you the category before the, the map. Let me show you, wait a second. Well, we have a classification, but I will show you later on, on the 
on the presentation. Um, so the classification will be Petit Chablis, then we have the Chablis, then the Premier Cru and the Grand Cru. So the Petit Chablis, it's, it's the beginning of the, it's the beginning of the stage, if we can say that. And, uh, well, the objective is just a small introduction about the Kimi region. Because Chablis is a really small, small town, but what is different from the Chardonnay to the north in Chablis and from the Chardonnay to the south in Chablis, it will be the terroir, the terroir and the different climate that we have in this area. So at the end, as I said before, uh, the, the town is very, very small and it's divided by a river. The river is called the Serran, the quiet. And this, the quiet, it's actually showing two landscapes here. I will have a small video that shows us the landscape, but in the left side, we have the Grand Cru and some of the Premier Cru, which have the greatest concentration. And then the left side, we have uh, some of the Premier Cru. So at the end, it will be like the river is going in between, and then we have two reliefs to the right and to the left. So, so we can travel together, like if we were flying up in the vines, here we have a, snow, a nice view of the village. And as I was saying, on the right side, we have the Grand Cru here. We have some of the Premier Cru here, and we have some of the Premier Cru right there. Uh, in William Fair, we own a land in every single, not in Grenouille, in almost all the Grand Cru here. But Grenouille and Blanchot, those two, we don't, we don't have them, but Les Clos, Les Preuses, Bougon, Vaudessier and Volmure, they are very well represented with the state. Uh, well, what's the difference between a Grand Cru, a Premier Cru, or a simple Chablis, or a Petit Chablis? We will see that. We will see that because the next wine is a Chablis. Uh, the difference in the the difference in, in, in the aromas and the difference in the mouth will completely change in the complexity of the wine too, because we have different co concentration in, this, in the soil. And also here we can see the exposition up, up from the sky. Maybe we see that it's a little bit plain, but actually this, um, this, um, how do you say that? This, uh, yeah, this uh, is very steep. It's like 45 degrees steep. And uh, yeah, the exposure is different in every single parcel. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for the second wine, the Chablis. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. We have when, I when I share the screen, I'm not able to see you, but I hope you're still there. <laughs> yes, yes, we are all here. We all here. So, uh, Perfect. so please, no, please continue. Just went with the Chablis, with the Petit Chablis. I'm sorry, it's a very simple wine. It's meant to be drinking young, uh, to refresh. Uh, may, you can drink it by itself. We don't have to, I mean, if, if we have some fish, etc., it goes very well, but otherwise, it's meant to be fresh, friendly, and uh, yes, very affordable to the mouth. Ooh. If we go by the Chablis, if you have Two glasses, that would be the idea. So you can compare and go back and compare. If not, it's okay. But just to let you know, well, the Chablis, it's another step. The Chablis, it's actually the, the village appellation. And um, here we have uh, in green, in the green area where actually they are planted. So um, we have something magical about this terroir, which is called the Kimilitian. And the Kimilitian will make the difference from a Chardonnay from Chablis and from a Chardonnay from the Condor, because take a look at this, it's oyster fossils that actually have remained since a long, long time ago, whenever the, 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 the landscape actually was, was, was getting formed, uh, whenever the Alps actually were, were born, the different landscape um, with different status and the key region is, is, is the age where the soil was born. So we have a lot of chalk. Uh, in the Côte d'Or we have more of a clay and we have more of a grape. So this, this guy will make, as we can see in this picture, the soil very white and we will have a very pure and liner Chardonnay. So um, going back to the Chablis, to our Chablis, well, this is the the represent it means to, to be representative of course of the region uh, something in chablis that it's happening so in the area of course chablis is a very well-known appellation but with the time uh, we 
they have suffered a lot from the from from the nature. It means that sometimes we have frost, sometimes we have um, we have uh, very heat waves, and sometimes the nature can be really uh, mean in this area. So with the time, uh, the, the area has been becoming a little bit more expensive in general, but it's still it's not as doesn't have the same value yet than the Condor. Why? First of all, the profile is different. Second of all, uh, well, there are wines that normally they age a little bit less than the one from the Condor. We can consider that at Chablis we will age it in a, a, two to three years, maybe not more, because the objective is to drink it fresh. Uh, something different between the Chardonnay from Chablis and the Condor. Chablis, the, the objective is to be lined up, citrus and then uh, yeah full of uh, full of uh, straightened aromas instead of a greasy or uh, more opulent ones so perfect perfect for all the fish for, perfect for the raw fish and all the all the crabs actually our first market in, in the world it's japan because it goes perfectly with japanese food and it's a it's always a nice combination so if we keep on going with uh, with William Fever, actually, well, we we have achieved a very nice wine. Why? Because we work extremely. We are really ex yeah ex extremely accurate on the vineyard. We started a high environmental value certification a, a long time ago. The objective of this certification is French, but recognized in the European Union. It's to fight against all the monoculture. The monoculture, you know, with the, 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 the history, uh, they started planting vines all over and uh, taking out the trees, etc. The objective is to go back a little bit uh, to the landscape that we used to have before uh, with some of the trees, with uh, the, yeah, making the biodiversity come back again. So we have a small farm in the in the domain. I will show you some pictures later. We do some uh, honey. We believe in, in the presence of bees are very, very important. We are becoming organic in the whole state and we will be certified from the vintage 2022. So that's extremely good news. It's a lot of work, of course, but uh, we have a really strong enhancement uh, with the with this uh, it, yeah it's a it's a big engagement at the end with with the nature so um, all the process in in the vines and uh, are, we need to follow them uh, very strictly and we even we are actually one of the few domains that are harvest manually so uh, this is important because at the end you make the wine on the vineyard once it arrives to the winery the magic is already done because what it's important is to have nice grapes, to have, of course, nice wine. William Ferrer, we're very lucky. We have 72 hectares uh, located in a very nice terroir. So we have 15 hectares of Grand Cru and almost 16 hectares of Premier Cru. So this makes, uh, yeah, more than a third of, uh, of, of the domain actually located in this. As, we, as I said before, we have five Grand Different Cru's and five main premier crews with two different climates and subclimates. You know, in Burgundy, we have, uh, I'll show you later for the Condor, but we have the name, the premier crew, and then maybe a lieu -di, a lieu -di, which means that it's a small, specific place of the vineyard where actually the grapes come from. So if we can switch for the wines, I don't want to go super quickly, but maybe uh, we can throw the Petit Chablis off and maybe keep the Chablis and the moment because that will be also a huge step. Actually, Samantha, can I just ask you, uh, uh, it's about the, the, the Kimmeridge soil uh, you, you mentioned before. Is, is the, is the Kimmeridge more dominant in uh, the Chablis appellation than the Petit Chablis? Or do you also have the Kimmeridge in Petit Chablis? You are right. In the Petit Chablis, we don't have Kimmeridgen. I didn't say I didn't say it, but you are right. The Kimmeridgen is dominant in the Chablis, Premier Cru and Grand Cru. And the Petit Chablis, we have more of a, yeah, a grapes in, in clay, less Kimmeridgen than the other one. And I don't know if, if well, I would like the public to participate and interrupt me, of course, if you have some uh, remarks to do with the tasting. But it's amazing the, the difference between Petit Chablis and Chablis. And of course, it's almost everything because of the soil. And as we saw it on the map, let me show you again. Um, 
you can still see the screen, right? Yes. As we saw it on the map, the location is also different. The Petit Chablis, it's, it's far away from the Chablis area at the end. Well, far away, yeah? it's only like four kilometers. <laughs> but it's, it's farther than the Chablis. So take a look here, the Petit Chablis, it's in yellow, and the Chablis, it's in green. So the chimerigen concentration of soil, it's here. Here, then, we have more of a mix. A little bit of marl, yeah. more of a limestone, and here, of course, the chimerigen. You're right. Of course, you still have a lot of freshness and acidity in, in the Petit Chablis, but, but the, the nerve of the Chablis, the, the, the fossils of, of the oyster shells, that's the, that's the heart of Chablis. So we have to go a bit up in, uh, in the Appalachians to, to get the, the real essence of Chablis. Exactly. Even though Petit Chablis is still uh, very wonderful and very fresh, but but you if you want to find the uh, you know when you can taste the sea almost from the fossils, we have to go to Chablis uh, uh, exactly. and and Chablis Premier Cru and Grand Cru. Okay. And it's true that, that we feel the sea. There's some of a yodum, you know, the yodum like the oysters actually in the nose, and that's why it's a perfect marriage. But yeah, it's a nice remark. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Uh, so if we can go to Mama. Uh, so the, the Mama is a Premier Cru. So the, the river is here just to give you an idea and we would be just in the left side, Mama. Um, it's a very famous Premier Cru that is actually showing something different. Uh, well, if someone wants to wants to tell me and of course in, interrupt me, I'm, I'm happy with that. But the moment and actually all the left side of the river, it's interesting because we will have more straightened notes. It means that uh, uh, the acidity will be lined up. Uh, we are meant to really refresh our papillos and be there. Of course, there's some of the floral notes. Uh, just let me change the one. We have some of the floral notes, but uh, it's more strict. If we go back to the left side here, where we have the concentration of the Grand Cru, then uh, the soil is a little bit deeper. It will it will give another it will give another profile. The 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 wines will be richer and uh, yeah maybe bolder. But in in this side in the Mama, as I said before, we have a lot of mineral aromas. Actually, very pronounced. That's the main objective. The the first the first notes that you can feel all the minerality, a little bit of a powder, uh, and uh, and yes. Great, actually, to to eat it with uh, I don't know a home omar and a, how do you call that a lobster and uh, even even on the shelves. Very nice. So okay, in in general, as with with the objective of this, of course, was presenting you William Fair, but mainly to to have this trip around the Appalachians in Chablis. Um, I don't know if you have any question for for the Chablis. Bouchard is very extensive, that's why I'm taking less time in, in William Fair than in Chablis, than Bouchard. But uh, let me know if you have any question here before we pass to the second part of the of the tasting slash presentation. Well, um, maybe I just can, can ask one question. Um, because normally uh, we, we here in Denmark have the perception of Chablis is a uh, Chardonnay uh, without wood, no barrels, mm -hmm. and uh, Côte d'Or, uh, Côte de Bonne uh, with barrels and wood. But that's not uh, quite uh, quite right because uh, you use, of course, uh, barrels in Chablis as well. Um, but maybe you can explain the the difference between barrel aging in Chablis and barrel aging in uh, in, in Marceau. Uh, Perfect. That's very interesting and that's a, a very important question because uh, with with the times, uh, vinification has changed. Uh, the objective in Chablis, of course, is to have a fresh wine full of, full of minerality and not to be oaky. It's super easy for a Chardonnay to be oaky because the Chardonnay is actually meant to marry with the oak and it goes super well. But if we put oak in Chablis, 
then we can kill this profile. But if you use oak in the right way, then you can have nice result without having the oaky notes. So what we do in Chablis, it's actually getting the old oaks from Bouchard. We use them in Bouchard five years, and then we take them to Chablis. So a five-year-old oak won't have the same impact as a new oak with all the aromas. What we do with the oak, we do all of Premier Cru and Grand Cru. Whenever we press the, the grapes, we put them in the barrel, and then the fermentation goes on inside the barrel. That allowed some micro-oxygenation all around the wine and a nice evolution until the malolactic comes by itself. So remember that we have, well, two, two fermentations, the one to, to forget the alcohol and the second one to, to convert one of the malic acid, the malolac, the, ma, the malic acid into lactic acid. Is the other way around? No, I don't, I'm not mistaken. So this conversion of the acid, it's to make the acid actually lighter and to digest it better, to integrate better to the mouth. Normally, so the first of all, it's um, it's a yeast. The first fermentation is a yeast. The second fermentation, it's a bacteria. And the bacteria, it's naturally installed in our case, so we don't really do anything. We don't need to do anything to to have it. So I come I come again to the vinification. We we receive the grapes. In William Fair, we have the chance of having a nice uh, level of, uh, well, we have three different levels in the winery. So first of all, the harvest arrived, we do the sorting table, it comes down to the press. So it goes press, we get the must, we put them in big tanks, and the big tanks stay in cold temperature for about a day or two. So we can have a natural decantation from the, yeah, for the must. And then the Chablis goes all to stainless steel, for the vinification, and then the Premier Grand Cru goes to the US barrels to have this fermentation. At the end of the fermentation, they go back to the stainless steel. Some of the Grand Cru's, they can stay a little bit longer on the barrels, but one part in the stainless steel. So at the end, we can have a nice balance without, uh, without any woody notes. So at the end, yes, you're right. The, the objective for us is preserving the acidity and pre preserving the purity and the minerality of the style of Chablis. We will see it the other way around in Bouchard, where we use a little bit more of an oak, but not new oak, uh, to have more of a greasy and, uh, and uh, creamy aromas. Exactly. Have you, uh, have you ever uh, experimented with uh... Uh, not doing the the malolactic fermentation to to keep uh, all the malic acid in terms of getting even more freshness and and sharp acidity, or has it always historically been that way in Chablis that you do the malolactic uh, to to smoothen uh, the the acidity a bit? Yes, it's actually the style that the winemaker likes. Uh, the malolactic for him is important to to uh, to round it. Yes, yep. it's it's still a matter of style. Of course, some of the producers can decide to stop it and uh, to get uh, the malic acid to to yeah. have more. Sure. So, so there are other producers that that don't do the malolactic fermentation in Chablis. They they are some producers that they don't like in Champagne and like everywhere. I mean, yeah. I don't know how much and I don't know who exactly. But yes, you can find some of the some of the producers that cut it. But to cut it, what do you put? Normally, it's sulfur. Sulfur to kill all the bacteria, so the malolactic won't go ahead. But I mean, you can do whatever. I mean, you can do whatever you want as long as the almost, appellation, almost. <laughs> as long as the appellation uh, allows you. But you're right. I mean, and and the the problem is not a problem. But in Chablis now we have a new tendency of getting wines in a more of a cut down style. It means that some of the producers are also. Uh, doing the other the other way around, like leaving a lot of oak and then maybe doing some more moldy chevy. That's another style. It's fair enough. I mean, depends what everyone likes. And uh, at the end, yeah, yeah, that's that's what they do. But yeah. in, in the case of William Fair, we would like to to, to preserve this uh, Chablis area. We were speaking about uh, with the with the winemaker about the new challenge with the weather. Yeah, especially the global warming. And at the end, he's very confident for the future. He said that in the past, in the, yeah, before 10, 10 years ago, whenever we didn't have this big hits of wave, uh, the Chardonnay and Chablis 
was having trouble to get mature whenever the harvest arrived. And now with the sun, he actually gets a nice point of uh, of matureness of, uh, of yeah matureness of yeah of ripeness. I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> and with a nice level of acidity. So he's very he's very positive about this new change because at the end it makes his work easier. <laughs> So, uh, well, the struggle with, with the nature in another way, with the, with the hail and with the storm, it's still there, with the frost, most of it. But, uh, well, I mean, depends on the year. Huh? 17 and 18, we were not touched, but 19, extremely bad. 20, yeah. bad. 21, extremely bad. So yeah. it depends. All right. Uh, we just have a, a question from uh, Gabriella. Uh, about the serving temperature, uh, which temperature would you serve these wines at, the Chablis? So the Petit and Petit Chablis, the Petit Chablis, honestly, okay, the ideal is 12, 13, but uh, if you take it out from the fridge, I love it, especially for these summer days. Petit Chablis and Chablis are super nice to drink next to the pool, like almost frozen, so it's nice, it's not a problem. For the Premier Cru, which would be nice, Drinking it with, I don't know, with maybe a sushi or some tapas uh, or fish, whatever. Well, 14 would be great because if it's too cold, it can be a little bit, uh, yeah, you can hide some of the notes. Then in some Monma, it's like a wine that has more complexity. So the ideal would be more of a 14, 15 degrees. All right. Thank you. I hope, Gabriela, that's, that's a good answer for you. Perfect. Well, if we continue our trip, I'll show you then the difference between the soil. Well, of course, it changes from one village to another, but here we have the typical soil of the Côte, of the Côte de Pudor. So as you, as you saw before for the Kimmer region, we even had the oysters, uh, we had a lot of uh, shock, and here we have limestone, uh, we have, yeah, we have a little bit of clay and even sand. So the color changes completely, huh? and that's why, I mean, it's one, one of the reasons, of course, that the Chardonnay will express completely different. When I was speaking about uh, Burgundy, I was saying that we have the soup appellations. Uh, I'll do the best example would be Mersole Cru. But just to explain you uh, how it works in, in terms of uh, the classification, so we have the same classification, as I said, for Chablis, so we have uh, the regional, which would be the equivalent to Petit Chablis. Then we have the villages, Chablis, or different villages in Côte d'Or. Then we have the Premier Cru, and then we have the Grand Cru. So, okay, now it's simple, but here we start the complicated. We have here, for example, when we see the label, the name of the village, and the name of the village can have something else added. It means that it comes specifically from one parcel or specifically from a sub appellation. It means, for example, Louis Saint Georges is the name of the village, but it's a premier cru. So it's a premier cru, a parcel which is called Le Caille. In this parcel, Le Caille, we can have one, two, three, ten producers, depends on where we are. And uh, what is rich about Burgundy is that, for example, when you have the village, here is one village. So all the, the vines that are next to the village as our village appellation. If you go up to the hill, then you have here the best of the best, the Grand Cru. And here you have the Premier Cru. So all around this area of the Grand Cru, you have some Premier Cru here, some Premier Cru here, but the villages are really, really around the village. From the other side of the highway, we have the regional appellation. So this is magical, but in a way it's very logical to understand. Why? Because it's the Cistercian monks, I'm sorry, that made this classification and uh, they were very smart because they did the classification according to the different exposition and according to the soil. They took, I don't know, a huge amount of samples to analyze how the soil was different and they divide it into different appellations. That's why we have plenty of different subappellations. I guess they, they did have a lot of time for it. So um, for, in terms of the appellation, we have 30, 33 Grand Cru, 44 villages in Premier Cru, and seven regionals. So as I was saying, we will start with Merceau Le Clou, then we will start with the Macon later. But Merceau, 
as you said, as you see, we have Merceau, which is the village, and then Les Clous. Les Clous is not a premier clou, but Les Clous is a parcel specific that it's up in the hill. And in this parcel, uh, we have, well, we're lucky, we'll almost have uh, six hectares there, which is, which is quite a lot. But um, so since we are only getting our grapes from this parcel and we are vinifying it apart, that's why we have Merceau and the Subclimat Le Clou. But let's, let's, let's stop speaking and go to the Macon Unisat Pierre. If you can pour, it, pour your wine at the same time as, as me. So the Macon Unisat Pierre, we go down to the south, down to the south of Burgundy. So if we were in Chablis and then from Chablis to Bonn, we have two hours drive. And then from Bonn to Macon, we have one hour and a half drive. So Macon is very, very at the south of Burgundy. It's a very nice village, which make uh, nice and affordable wines. Uh, Macon is the name of the village. Luny, it's the name of another mini tiny village next to it. And I think we see it here on the map. Uh, I'll, fi I'll, find it, I'll find it later. It's a little bit flurry. And then from a vines that is called Saint Pierre. So again, can be complicated, but it comes from Luni, Luni, and then the vine Saint Pierre. Well, anyway, this wine is also uh, one of the first stages. It's the Chardonnay that it's it's meant to be easy. It's meant to be uh, more of a greasy if we compare it, of course, now we change of terroir, now we change of exposition. So uh, it's more of a it's more of a greasy wine, but not, I mean, without being, of course, something very complex, like a, like a very friendly, a little bit of a dry fruits that we can find in the wine. And uh, yeah, some some bouquet of flowers, it's it's very pleasant. So the same, I would recommend it only for an aperitif or maybe eating with something very, very easy during the summer. It's it's nice. It's it's meant to be drinking John and uh, well, for the aging, it actually goes to the stainless steel and depending on the vintage, it stays, I don't know, maybe six or seven months. But this is also a wine that won't age a lot. So this is. An, an introduction for the Domaine Bouchard Pérez. We are right in the in the entrance of Bonn, of Bonn village. Uh, I'm actually next to next to the chateau. So uh, um, I hope you were here so we could actually taste together. But uh, uh, just to give you uh, some facts about Bouchard, it's a no family from the 1731. Uh, they actually um, they, they actually were located from the 1731 started making wine here in the area. Um, I'll go back to the history later on, but I wanted to remind you a little bit of how I was talking before about the classification. So in the production in, in Burgundy, so we have uh, mainly, of course, in volume, the regional appellation. The regional is all that says Bourgogne Pinot Noir or Bourgogne Chardonnay. Then we go to the village appellation, as I said, it can be Henri saint georges Apomar, Amerso, etc. If we go to Premier Cru, then we have the name of the village plus another parcel, which is another Premier Cru appellation. And of course, the Grand Cru, which is la crème de la crème, the top of the top, but it's produced in very limited quantities. At the end, it represents only the 1% of the appellation. And um, well, as you can see at the end, this is the division between red wine and white wine production. At the end, we make more wine, in, more more white wine in Burgundy than red wine. Uh, the Grand Cru's are divided in 50-50, but for the um, regional and villages, mainly whites. So this is also, of course, a lot because of the Macone area, which is a big, big producer of white wines. Uh, to go back to Bouchard, well, it's a very, very old state. We have a great chance, as we saw before, the, the castle. Uh, it was purchased by the family um, just after the French Revolution. And this acquisition, it was very nice because we have the castle. And 10 meters down, we have these nice caves where we actually uh, age our wines three years. 
because the conditions of temperature and humidity are perfect. So we have, we are very lucky. We have one of the oldest collections in, in the whole Burgundy. We have plenty, plenty of, uh, of very old bottles. And uh, well, the family has, has known how, how to keep this, this heritage uh, big and of course, uh, and of course still in our cellars. What they do, the winemaker actually and his team, um, they do some lots, they divide it by lots, and every 30 years they open the lot, they change the cork, and of course whenever you open a model, then the volume gets down to taste it. So we sacrifice one of the bottles from the lot to refill the other ones and to make sure that the cork will live at least 30 years and not the wine to get, uh, yeah, to get to, to get back. So and you, you should be sitting in, in the cool cellar right now, but maybe there's no Wi-Fi. Exactly, there's no Wi-Fi, but I, sh I should be with you guys. What, what, how's the temperature in the cellar? Um, steady all year round? Yeah, it's between 9 to 10 degrees. Yeah, nine Oh, to I would love to sit down there right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that's a great, it's the greatest place to be, but you're right, there's no Wi-Fi over there. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a little bit humid during the winter, it's not so cozy after all. Uh, no, but cheers with the Macum. And uh, I think this is a this is a very very different profile, and it will be even different whenever we go uh, up to Merceau. Uh So Merceau. Merceau, it's a very nice village actually, mainly for the whites. There's a small of the red production, but uh, what I can say is that Bouchard haven't speak enough about this appellation and it's a shame because we are uh, actually one of the biggest productions in, in productors in Merceau. We have 20 hectares, which is quite big. Uh, we have six premier crew. Uh, we have the Genevrière, we have the Perrière, the Charme, the Goutte d'Or, Porisso et Boucher. Uh, most of them are there in Denmark with Eric Sorensen. And we have two villages. So we have the Merceau domain and we have the Merceau le Cru. And in this case, Le Merceau Le Clou, I invite to, to taste it. So Merceau, it's a very known village, as, as you know it already, and in general gives a different Chardonnay. Why? Normally it's very creamy, it's very caramelized, it's more of a, even a little bit of chocolate, roasted, toasted notes. But Merceau Le Clou is special because Merceau Le Clou comes from a, like a small mountain, so up in the here, we have the parasol, which is very well exposed, but it's also close to the forest, which gives freshness. So Merceau Le Clou at the end, we, the objective is to have more floral than caramel, to be more refreshed than, than, a, than, a, creamy, than a creamy Chardonnay. Um, I want to... I would like to taste all the wines with you, but I someone has to speak. So <coughs> going back to, to, to Bouchard, what we do, the same philosophy as um, William Fair, we have also the high environmental value certification. All of harvest is uh, manual. It's very important to keep the quality, of course, uh, during the whole process of the vines. And um, and also we are in, or, in organic conversation conversion. Uh, just to end with the Merceau Le Clou, it's, uh, it's, um, I'm sorry, I'm a <laughs> I drink too fast. So I made a mistake, I, I said we had uh, six hectares, but actually we have uh, 8.6 hectares, which is quite a lot. Uh, we are very lucky because this is a nice appellation that we always have nice volume, nice allocations in this. The soil, uh, we have more of a moral thing. So as we saw in the picture, yes, we have more of a brownie, whenever we see the soil we have more of a brownie that will give actually a, a deep Chardonnay, uh, big notes of expression. So um, for the aging, as, as we were speaking about the barrels, what we do in Bouchard is keeping the barrels for five years, not to have, of course, a big lot of new barrels. Every year we only change the 10% of the barrel, per, of the barrel yeah, lots, and uh, otherwise we use the old ones. It's important not to wooden so much the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir because at the end they're very refined varietals that come from a 
from a fine terroir. So we don't want to touch them. We want to leave the style. Uh, something important about Bouchard is that um, it's, a, it's a house that uh, the main objective, we have 130 hectares, so it's, it's big, we're quite lucky to have this uh, huge uh, property, especially because 70% of this 130 hectares is Premier Gran Cru, so we're very, very lucky. But something important about us, since the family started doing the wines until the family took, the, took over the, took over the, the, um, the roots, uh, it's to keep the pureness of each appellation. So now, of course, we have new tendencies in general all over the world about pushing the acidity or pushing the reductive notes, uh, which is nice. I mean, I, I also love those wines. But to explain you about Bouchard is to keep a very a pureness of every single appellation, not to do so much makeup, if I can call it this way. The makeup for me, it's maybe leaving it a lot in the oak because you give oaky notes, so it's like a makeup with the girls, but also the reductive notes that you get them whenever you put them on the lease. You know, the lease are the 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 remain from 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 the most whenever uh, you press the most and then you have the little particles of the of the grapes, then the lease. Uh, are, are the, the this substance that actually decants in the wine. And this is nice because you can keep them and they will give nice flavors and aromas to it. So at the end, uh, if you keep them, you can give other notes like uh, reductive notes, like uh, uh, further notes, which are nice. But the objective for us is really to respect the line of the appellation, not, not to, to, yeah, not to, put some makeup on the wine and uh, and keep on this straight lining in our vinifications. Uh, yeah. well. if, I, if I may add, uh, I totally agree. Uh, I've, I've tasted your wines uh, through uh, a lot of years uh, and, and your tendency to use less oak and uh, less uh, things like a batonnage uh, and, and things like that, the, the makeup you, you say, uh, I think it really uh it's it's good for the wine but you still get the the creamy texture of a merceau and you still have uh the 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 buttery notes uh but it but it's not uh, too much and it's not masked with anything else it's just uh, uh expression of of the terroir uh, i think it, it's it's a really really good uh where you are right now in in your winemaking Exactly. Well, it's part of the philosophy. Of course, the the winemaker adapts it also to to the to the to the vintage. Yeah? For example, he was explaining to us that for this vintage, he got a lot of tartaric acid naturally on the wines. So what he will do is maybe leave it a little bit longer on the barrel so they can breathe and the acidity can actually uh, be integrated in the wines. Depends on in the vintage, he can leave the wines more or less either in a barrels or stainless steel. And of course, the years now are being very different because we have sometimes a very solar year and some of the years are a little bit more of a rainy and uh, and dry and then dry. And so it can change from one year to another and he adapts the vinification. Also for the reds, for example, not, not, we are not tasting the reds, but uh, there's also these um, nice ways of playing with the ruffle from the grapes. So if you have the perfect raffle, then you can vinify with them. And uh, because the raffle will be an advantage, whenever you press, the raffle will, will give some space. So for the juice to go through the whole, we call it gâteau. Gâteau, it's like a cake. Okay. So, and, and the raffle also contains some of the sodium from the plant that will also help the fermentation and the small yeasts that need vitamins. So, so the fermentation will go well. If but you have also, uh, do you also have uh, have tannins uh, to extract have, from there? Yes, right. We have tannins on the raffle, and we can find good tannins if the raffle is ripened, but we can have uh, bad tannins if the raffle is green. Yeah. So that's why, depending on the year, he decides to either put some raffles, either put the whole cluster, or either um, this team in before putting into the tanks. Yeah. And of course, the appellation. Now, sometimes we don't have the same maturity in one village than another. Whenever we pick, and uh, of course, we try to to calculate the best ideal date of picking. But uh, 
if if something goes differently and 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 the maturation of the ruffles or the skins are different, but he needs to adapt. But uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Nice remark. Thank you. Perfect. So Mersoliclou, uh, Mersoliclou is a village. That's why we are tasting it before uh, before Bordeaux Chateau. Huh? But going back to the domain, uh, well, as as you know, the the vine are, is is actually a changing plant depending on the season. So well, it's a little bit of a reminder in, in all the work that we need to do in. in during the seasons. So during the winter, it's the time of sleeping. Actually, the vine doesn't have any any leaf, and uh, she keeps the um, she keeps the uh, you know the, the small juice that give her all the energy, so she can she can recover. They prune it. They prune it in the way that he will keep all his energy contained for the spring. So then the spring comes, and then. Here we have something very delicate because it will give the flowering. To get the flowering, we need to get the bud burst. So this is so we just had a, a, a big problem with this year. Um, we got the frost, and if the frost come just when the bud burst is there, it's very dangerous because it can get frozen. And if it gets frozen, we don't have any flower. If we don't have flowers, we don't have grapes. If we don't have grapes, we don't have wines. So we were fighting a lot against this. At, at the end of the presentation, I will show you a very nice picture that was taken during the fight of frost. What do they normally do is to put some candles in the vineyard to heat them up, to put some fans so we can uh, move the air around. If we move the air, we can gain between one or two degrees. Uh, or if you have a lot of money, you can take an helicopter and fly over your vineyard. Of course, this will also give you maybe three or four degrees more. But if the temperature goes really down to minus seven or more, then it's going to be sure that we're going to have the damage. So, for example, 2019 vintage that will come soon to Denmark, we had a lot of problems of the frost. So the vintage was super small. We almost had like 35 percent of a regular crop, which is really sad. But if you were wondering why the prices of Burgundy are going up and up, it's not only because Burgundy is uh, now a very well known appellation, it's mainly because with the nature we suffer a lot. And of course, the less wine you have and the more demand you have, then the prices change. So, well, passing this, the, the spring, we have the summer. The summer work. We already the, the flowers already converted in uh, in little grapes, and these grapes for the reds they will convert to red, but for the chardonnay will come from this color of green to green, a little bit more pale. So at the end, uh, the summer is critical. Of course, uh, we need to get a lot of sun, but it's nice to get some water, not to suffer any any, any of the dryness. The vine, the vine is like a child. I've always said. The vine needs to have a good conditions to good make good wines. But if you give them all all the good conditions, then she will be, uh, yeah, she will be like a like a bad educated child. Like if you give the child all the candles he wants, all the hours of TV, he will be spoiled. The same if you give the 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 vine a sun and also water, she will be spoiled and she will give big grapes. You don't want big, um, full of water grapes. The ideal is to be a little bit strict of the with the vines. So, for example, the irrigation in France is forbidden. Um, and the vine will naturally look uh, with the, her roots to get some humidity from the soil. Of course, when it rains, uh, the soil will keep some, some of the humidity she, she needs. But the vine, the, the perfect conditions are actually is little bit of rain, but not too much, a little bit of sun, but not too much air, a lot of air. So we won't have any diseases planted on it. And then, of course, after the harvest, the autumn comes and the autumn makes uh, these beautiful landscapes in Burgundy with all the uh, red and uh, yellow leaves. As I was saying, we have now the certification and we're looking for this one. We're estimating to be certificated completely organic on the 2024. And this is a major thing because we will be the biggest, um, well, the, the first biggest state here in Burgundy being, being organic. So very good news. 
Um, as I was saying before, we have 130 hectares, which is very nice, with uh, 450 subplots. And uh, for that area, we need a lot of uh, wine growers. And uh, I mean, the, the people that's working with us on the vines, uh, they need to be very precise, but we need a lot of people to do a lot of the different stages. As you know, in the organic uh, organic practices, it means that we are reducing extremely all the treatments. So instead of the treatment, you need to work the soil. You need to uh, cut in the maintain your vines in the perfect con in, the, in the best condition as possible. Um, for the harvest day, as I was saying, it's always tricky to choose the date between your optimal ripeness and uh, to keep the levels of acidity nice and the optimal level, of course, of alcohol to have a very balanced, uh, yeah, balanced one. So uh, it's it's very tricky to choose one with it because that would be the one of the keys to achieve your your wine. Um, I don't know if you have any question from here. Before we pass on for the vinification. Um, no, but maybe you can um, you can uh, you can tell a little bit about uh, the the options you have in in your uh, winery because uh, you have a, a rather large winery with a, a lot of uh, tanks for fermentation. So. Um, Sometimes when 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 we talk, you, we we hear about you, you have uh, the the muscles and and the hand power to, like you said before, to to maybe uh, harvest uh, a vineyard in in two or three steps because you have uh, the space in the cellars to to vinify it uh, separately and then mix it. If it's uh, mm -hmm. if it's very difficult to to uh, to know when when to harvest, then you can't right. divide it because you have uh, the the space in the cellar for it. You're right. Actually, if if there's if there's one day where you have three or four appellations at the same time, then you need to pick them all in one day. It's very tricky. Yes. So what we do is we hire almost 200 persons for the harvest during yeah. at least two or three weeks, depending on how the maturation goes. And we have a great facility, as you said, in the winery. We have 10 different entrances, 10 different doors to receive the harvest. So what we do is uh, use these cases of 13 kilos. So we put them one after the other so they won't touch and they won't, they won't crush the grapes. When the truck arrives with this, normally we try to do it. If it's too warm, we do it very early in the morning. Otherwise, uh, the, the objective of this winery, which is actually in the middle of the Côte d'Or, is not to take more than uh, 30 minutes to go from the south to, to the winery and not to take more than 30 minutes from the north to the winery. So it's rushed, right in the middle. As you said, we have 10 different entrances, a lot of sorting tables whenever it arrives. We have different levels, like in William Taylor, where I said that. So in the first level, we have the sorting table, the grapes arrive, people select them. And then for the whites, it goes to the press. Of course, here we have an example. Uh, if these were red, the Pinot Noir, depending on the appellation, either it goes to a stainless steel, either it goes to this uh, wooden O tags. But uh, in the in in the in speaking about the Chardonnay, so we press it, and then whenever we press it, it goes through a stainless steel stack to do uh, some timing with the cold and separate, uh, as we said before, with the with the heaviest material and then the least. And of course, the rest of the juice. But that's interesting. It's important. It's it's also nice to have this facility of a new winery where we can enter a lot of a lot of kilos of grapes at the same time, and we can keep being exigent with this exact space. Exactly, so, uh, and and that that's why I I think you you have so high quality in your wines every year, even though it, it's it's a difficult year. You always get the best out of your grapes because you you have uh, the facilities to to make the best out of it. You're so. right. You're right. And at the end, the key it would be, of course, selecting the best date of harvest. But if you have a bad year and then you are you are obligated to harvest when it's not to reap and yeah. maybe there was some diseases. Well, the key would be the sorting, the selection. Yes. So you, we sort at, we sort manually, so you can see uh, whenever you're cutting, not to cut the bad things, and whenever it arrives, someone else looking for the good grapes. So this is this is one of the keys, of course. 
Um, in, in the winery, we have, as I said, three levels. So the first of all is the arrival of the grapes, then the second label whenever we vinify, and the third label, which is also 10 meters down, it's our cellar of, uh, of the barrels, which have a great great also conditions of temperature, very um, uniform during the whole year. And um, well, I put here some of the videos that the, the it's very nice. I mean, it's very educative, but they made by the Veve, which is the like the Institute of uh, of wine of wines from Burgundy, and they explain really step by step how the white and the red is with the Pinot and the Chardonnay, which is interesting. I'll send you the presentation later on, so you can click on it and maybe get a little bit uh, to get a little bit. Uh, more information about the about the vinification, but we have five minutes less. Less, I'm sorry, but um, so let's go to the to the last wine, Bon du Chateau. Last but not least, it's very important for Bouchard Bon du Chateau. We have the Bon du Chateau red and the Bon du Chateau white. Uh, the Bon du Chateau. It's a label that it was done by the family uh, in 1907. The objective of Bon du Chateau is represent what Bon Premier Cru means. So for the Reds, we own a huge land and for the Whites, a small land because the Whites represent at least three, ten, not even 10 percent of the whole red area in Bon Premier Cru. What's important about Bon, and I think we haven't speak enough yet about this appellation, is that we offer elegance, we offer boldness, we offer a lot of nice expressions, yeah, very nice notes from this wine, and we haven't actually communicated maybe enough. It's, a, it's an appellation that's still very affordable, thanks to that, because it's not super famous as Merso. For example, if we compare it, I'm not sure uh, how much does it cost uh, in Denmark, but the prices are not that far, and we have Mersolet Cru, which is a village, but we have a Bon Premier Cru, which is a Premier Cru. <laughs> uh, and then the prices are not so different because Bon by itself is already a very famous appellation that has already a bigger price. And Bon in general, for the reds and for the whites, are a great, great value uh, quality ratio price because uh, we have. Of course, a different profile. Huh? The, the, the Chardonnay here, uh, we will have a limestone, we will have clay, we will have marl, but the expression will be, he's actually over, uh, very on, extroverted. If he was a person, I would qualify as an extroverted. It's affirmated, it's it's very sure from himself. So, uh, Bon du Chateau, it's a, it's a blend huh? between four different parcels of Bon Premier Cru. If you have the chance to come to Burgundy, I'll take you there so you can see them. They are four parcels together of Chardonnay next to the next to the Pinot Noir, and it's very interesting. And uh, well, we produce uh, around nine hectares here, so uh, also a very nice availability from from this. Uh, before I, I show you the nice picture, I don't know if you have any question um, for the moment. Uh, no, it doesn't look like it right now. OK, perfect. So that, that means you are explaining very well <laughs> when there's no questions. I hope so. so thank maybe, you so much. Or maybe the whites are all drunk, I hope. <laughs> oh. Already having the weekend done. Now, this is the, the picture I wanted to show you at the end uh, from the sky whenever we were fighting against the frost. So all the candles are, are on in, of course, some of the specific parcels. Why are there more candles here than here? It's because um, the temperature, the cold temperature concentrated here more than up in the hill. But uh, well, it's part of it's part of one of the methods that we do. And uh, well, this year we didn't save much. We will see how is it next year. I hope next vintage will be more generous in general than than 1920 or 21. All right, thank you so much, Samantha. It's really good uh, explanations you have and uh, a good tour through Chablis and uh, and the rest of Burgundy. So so thank you so much for your time. Uh, you. If there are any questions, please uh, write them in the chat and uh, and we can uh, ask Samantha before she uh, goes on weekend. <laughs>
we will do the same. And you too. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a it's a great way to start the weekend by tasting a, a lot of uh, white sure. burgundy in in a hot summer day. Bremen, Bremen, raise the hand. Yes. Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions. So uh, once again, Samantha, thank you so much for uh, taking your time and uh, giving us this tour of uh, of Burgundy. We will love to come and visit you uh, as soon as we can. Uh, we we miss yeah. getting getting out of uh, our houses. Uh, I I can just uh, yeah, you can maybe see John. Uh, Thank you, John. One of the best. Wow. Thank you, John. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. And you get to know that if you're ever coming this summer or whenever you go down to Burgundy, because at the end it's not so far in Cara, uh, in Bouchard, you can visit the sellers. So uh, either you get online on the on the contact of Bouchard, either you ask you ask Martin the contacts, but you're welcome to visit your sellers. Uh, the 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 castle has a program of visiting, and it's very it's very nice. It's very historical and comes with a tasting, so it's good. It's good. Thank you so much.